services they're called the different exposed um, interfaces that are public facing like a, a login page to Facebook or YouTube or your email those are uh, public facing interfaces they're intended for your convenience they also are inherently dangerous because they're an attack service that's the first point of contact for hackers who's trying to exploit um, a legitimate system for nefarious purposes um, and so that's exactly what had happened. Dad had employed a system called VNC, which was intended for the remote control of each of the computers at the radio station. Um, I, I had not pressed in too hard on it over the years, but I knew there was a potential issue. Um, and after the fact, I wish I had pressed it harder because what had happened was we discovered in the logs after the attack got real bad, um, we would shut down one attack and it would pop up on another computer and so on and so forth. Well, what happened was um, Dad had employed uh, a practice that uh, is not a, a great practice. You, you've heard of the, the security concept of maintaining different passwords for different interfaces or different sites, Facebook, YouTube, Gmail, your campus mail, whatever it may be. Maintaining a different password for each of those really is a good practice and it's highly inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So most people don't do it, myself included sometimes. 
Um, uh, I have I have a systematic variation on passwords. When I change one password for a customer, there is a, a systematic variation for each of the different systems that that password belongs to. So it actually is very similar. And I know what that variation is. And I know how it's calculated. So I know what the passwords are for everything when I change to one. Um, uh, it may be as simple as the concept of adding an exclamation point for each service. Uh, you use Gmail primarily. You have your password, and then you have a Facebook password, which is the same as your Gmail password with an exclamation point. Things like that are very good uh, practices. That being said, Dad was not doing that. And for each one of the computers at the radio station, he had a, a separate interface, public facing for his convenience. And they all had the same password. So when the hackers found one, they had them all. And they had access to each one of his computers. And because they're so efficient uh, in the way they attacked, as soon as I would shut one down, we'd see another one take off. And fortunately, Dad had the foresight to shut down the primary automation computer as the attackers were executing software on um, a little bit of basic information on the, on the software that was used. Um, it came out some years back, 2013, I think, and it is uh, cryptographic software that's intended specifically to encrypt all of your data on the computers. It overrides the old copies of it um, with zeros so that it can't be recovered. And then you're left with only encrypted files of all uh, Copies of all of your important files. Those encrypted files then are accompanied by a text file. Um, we we came across some, well, probably a half a million copies of this text file. And as you open it up, it says you've been compromised. We've encrypted your data. In order to unencrypt your data, to decrypt your data, you're going to need a special copy of proprietary software that you've programmed. We have the only copy of the key. And uh, in order to get this uh, data decrypted, you're going to have to pay us uh, a certain number of dollars. And in order to find out what that amount is, please visit this website. And we'll go from there. Well, of course, uh, Dad being principal, he said, no, I'm not even going to go see. So we don't know what they would have charged. But I do know from previous, in, uh, previous instances, um, the worst of which was an attack on Sweet Home Oregon when I was working for an IT company in Salem. Uh, the entire uh, city was brought down. The court system, the police department, the school districts, the water treatment plant, uh, library, everything was brought down, brought to its knees. Not only that, the company that had uh, been responsible for maintaining the backups had their backups uh, in the same physical location connected to the same physical network with the same administrative credentials for that that they did for the rest of the network. So because one was compromised, the backups too, compromised. the only copy of backups we had was uh, a copy backup that would be manually swapped out of the month. So they lost several weeks of data and we had to then go and basically tell everyone, uh, police department and courts included, we do not have a current copy of the, the data. This is the newest copy we've got. They have to go back to your paper records and so on and so forth. Do their best to pull this thing back. So it was a bad situation. Um, and uh, so that's a that's a like a worst case scenario. Same same type of thing that, that happened to Dad's uh, radio station. Fortunately, we got it shut down. We got compromise figured out. Give you an idea of the tenacity of. Uh, Hackers, people who will look for a legitimate attack surface or a legitimate interface um, and turn that into an attack surface. This was what you call a brute force attack. It sends as many requests uh, to the interface as possible. And uh, with this system, it's apparent that they were using an automatically generated password. They would use a dictionary, which was it's, it's called a dictionary attack. In combination with uh, with the system that generates numbers, so it would start with let's say let's say you're waiting on the dictionary and you're at the word faith. You go faith zero, faith one, faith two, faith three. 
through phase nine, and it would go phase 10, phase 11, and then it would go and switch up each of these numbers. So you've got big, long passwords. The number of attempts uh, against dad's network uh, approached almost 10 million <coughs> over the period of three years. And that's against one computer actually on the network. So he had seven computers that were exposed to the internet. Um, I didn't tally the, the total number of attacks, but it's a lot. It's a whole lot. I mean, thousands of attacks a day, um, tens of thousands per day. And that's a very common thing. If I, if I configure an email server to uh, host email for a client of mine, I can absolutely expect that when I expose that so that they can access the email from a public facing interface, we have a minimum of five to 10,000 attacks per day on that interface uh, until I get mitigation put in place. Uh, mitigation is something that says if you have three or five illegitimate uh, password entries for an administrative interface within a period of, say, 30 seconds, then we're going to shut down that IP and that IP address, that, that unique address out on the internet is no longer allowed to attempt to access to this network for, say, 30 minutes. That, of course, cuts down tremendously um, because they can't just sit there and throw those dictionary attacks on the network. Um, so uh, that being said, we ultimately uh, get stood by the, the, the principle of the matter, of course. Um, we were stuck with a whole bunch of encrypted files and a whole bunch of files that we were able to recover because we shut it down before it completed. But it happened very fast. Um, it was very um, expensive, very dangerous. It brought the station to its knees effectively. But we had just enough data that we were able to get the automation system up and going with um, fairly little effort as opposed to what we would have been looking at, which is a complete rebuild of the whole thing. <clears throat> so now that's a that's a pretty uh, scary scenario, not extremely common in uh, in general. Uh, most antivirus systems, uh, most firewalls that are kept up to date and so on and so forth are pretty good at identifying the patterns uh, using heuristics, which basically is a pattern identification rather than a signature identification. Meaning if you've got a virus that executes on your computer that has a signature, but it also has a pattern of what it does. And so the antivirus systems and the firewalls identify the patterns rather than the unique signature. That way, if it's got a distant cousin that's doing the same thing, it doesn't have to know it by name. It doesn't have to know it by excuse me, by verification. It has to know it only by what it does. So those types of heuristics are getting better. Um, that being said, this is this is um, way above and beyond the the typical um, scenario. It's not extremely common. I I dealt with this I think five or six times. The crypto um, type. Scenario, those types of attacks. I've dealt with a whole lot of other attacks. The unique thing about a crypto attack, as opposed to any other uh, attack which is incoming, um, is for one, while they're very common, they're very uh, uncommonly successful. Um, and the other, uh, the other aspects of them that are uh, Similar are they only come into play if you're a person with attack, and that's where we end up with a whole bunch of uh, kind of funny scenarios uh, in the IT world where we have uh, misuse, uh, mis misattributed language and terminology. And like that. Uh, common use, I got that. My Facebook got that. And 99% of the time, someone says that's not true. Now let's play ball. Um, that goes to part of what Liz was wanting to address, which is also in platforms. We're going to touch on some of those briefly. Uh, so I sort of uh, addressed attack surfaces and what they basically are. They're for convenience, primarily. They can be remote access applications. Those can be pretty dangerous. Um, generally, the ones that are real popular, like go to my PC, uh, Team Viewer, things like that, those are okay. Um, they're encrypted, they're actually secure, um, 
But like most of what I'll talk about, it has less to do with whether the systems themselves are secure and more to do with user habits. Do you use the same password for everything? Um, what is the chance that you're going to use your password somewhere and somebody's going to get a hold of it and they're going to try it on everything else they can identify? That's where people get into real hot water, right? bank accounts, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a habitual problem. Um, so, uh, so, we have different scopes. Um, the purpose for, for this, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, but but um, but still give you a, a broad overview of, of the significance of each of these. Your computer, I mean, this one's pretty straightforward, um, and I do kind of hammer on this pretty hard with people, generally speaking, does what you tell it to do. It's inherently insecure because it does what you tell it to do. <laughs> um, so, when it comes to that, the best thing that you can do in any scenario is develop good habits, good browsing habits, so on and so forth. Don't uh, use the same password. Don't click on whatever uh, catches your eye on the internet. Um, I was joking with Jamie the other day when I was kind of going over uh, what, I, what I might address in some of this. Um, you know, if you're the type of person that's got that gets caught up on the home shopping network on TV, you're probably probably have a virus on your computer. It's actually I mean, a fairly uh, reasonable characterization, um, and I'll get into that in just a moment. So you've got your computer. That's the scope. That's my computer sitting here. I'm using it. It's doing what I tell it to do. It's going where I tell it to go. Generally speaking, almost without exception. Uh, the local network, if I connect into the wireless here, everything on this campus is tied together, and my computer becomes part of this local network. It's subject to the protection that this network has in play. And, uh, and my computer is, to some extent, subject to uh, the network in that it's only going to be able to talk to the places on the internet that this network will allow. Um, and the internet is only going to be able to talk to my computer under two uh, circumstances. One is my computer goes and requests, say, Amazon.com. So I go to Amazon.com, my computer sends a request out, goes through the firewall, the firewall logs that, it talks to Amazon, Amazon sends a response back, the web page on the images, the firewall looks at it and says, ah, this was a legitimate request, we can send it to your computer. And that's where it comes back. That firewall manages that communication, bi directional communication. Amazon can't just decide to send me a web page without my request because the firewall will see that and says, I don't know anything about this request, drops the traffic, and it goes no. Um, just falls off from that. Uh, when it comes to local networks uh, like this, they're well managed, they're well monitored, they have a, a lot of great tools in play, uh, undoubtedly, um, and they would have filtering and all kinds of stuff in play. Our home networks, our small business networks, uh, even up to medium-sized business networks. Um, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, multi-site business networks that are very poorly maintained, very poorly put together because they've had too many hands in there just kind of patched together to make it work. Um, that's not a great scenario. The best scenario is an overall analysis of the network and you pull it together as a whole so you have a a fully functioning mechanism to support your devices. But when we're dealing with a small network like a small business or our local home networks, we end up um, in a pre configured state. It's usually actually pre configured. Um, we don't typically have a whole lot of control over our local networks. Not that we can't, but we generally don't because it requires some more knowledge of. Uh, you know, the protocols and general operation. Um, it is trusted by default. When you connect to your home wireless and when your friend comes and connects to your home wireless, a lot of you will notice that your devices can see one another through that network. And the reason is because, uh, if you've noticed that, it's because that network is inherently trusted by the devices. It knows it's a local network. It says, okay, we're connected to a local network. This isn't a generic. Uh, Public hotspot, 
uh, we're connected with the password, we're encrypted, let's trust this. And then he leaves it up to that network, whatever firewall is on the network to control traffic to and from the internet. So that would be your modem, which is provided by your internet service provider like Comcast, CenturyLink, uh, whoever. Uh, it's trusted by default. Uh, doesn't do anything it isn't configured to do. Um, we generally don't get in configured to do anything as uh, home users and small business users generally don't try to. Um, it's going to let anything through that, uh, through that. If your computer goes out and requests a virus and the server sends a virus back through, it's going to say, okay, here you go. And it's going to give you that virus. Um, the virus is not going to just come through. Your computer in some form or fashion is going to go out and request it because a page came up and said, do you want to trust this thing? You click yes and it comes. That goes back to the user habits and the computer doing what we tell them to do. Um, the wide area network or the internet, you basically don't have any control over it. Um, advanced users like me, I have no control over it, generally speaking. I only have control over what comes from it, where that goes, um, and whether or not my computers can access it or whatever network I'm um, This is a basic overview of what a what a firewall does, as I've said, unwanted traffic or any, uh, this, this may not just be unwanted traffic, but it might just be unknown traffic. It's dropped at the firewall. The firewall analyzes and says, nothing asked for this, I'm going to drop it. There's no rule that I have in play that says this should go somewhere inside my network that I'm protecting. I'm going to drop it. So it just drops the, the traffic. It doesn't notify the system that it was dropped. It doesn't notify it. The, the remote system that it was there, it just it's gone. So from your computers, um, it's going to allow the traffic out and it's going to receive that traffic back in. Uh, firewalls follow strict, uh, follow strict rules, um, but they're not very intelligent. When we get a firewall from the internet service provider, they have a moderate firewall on them that's analyzing traffic. It's not going to do a whole lot for you except just basically protect the computer. And uh, I got that out of order, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so this is one of the things that we run into a lot. Um, I'm asked, I've been asked by Liz and uh, a lot of other people about uh, VPNs. We're seeing a lot of advertisement for VPNs and things like that. So uh, it's going to protect you, it's going to keep you anonymous, so on and so forth. Um, because it will encrypt your traffic. Most of your traffic's already encrypted. Facebook's encrypted, Gmail's encrypted, uh, YouTube's encrypted. Everywhere you go, pretty much is encrypted. When you look up at your address bar on your on your uh, web pages and you see that lock there, if that lock doesn't have an X on it or some sort of error over it, it means you're encrypted. It means that traffic is actually from your computer to the server, whatever page you're at, Nothing is going to intercept that and decrypt it, use your data. Um, the, the points of compromise happen at your computer almost always, or they might happen at the server somewhere in between. Almost not uh, This is a basic, basic idea. If we send plain text, hey, how are you? It travels through the internet using these keys. This is what is actually transmitted. If we send, hey, how are you? Not necessarily specifically this, but this is an example of what you would see if you tried to look at that. You can't read that without that key. So whoever's receiving that can't read it without that key. So the compromise would come if a hacker gets into your system, finds your key, then they can decrypt all this stuff that's going to. Um, and that's the, the, the most basic over, overview of how uh, encryption works. On the internet and it goes through this is called a tunnel basically it goes through a tunnel it's all encrypted it gets to the other end and they get to open the package because they have a key um, a vpn does that for us uh, yeah yeah so vpn technologies we've got two types uh, vpn initially was instantiated to secure business data Let's say I'm out in the field and I'm on a hot spot or I'm at a coffee shop and I want to access my business data. I tie in with the VPN and you can literally envision a tunnel between my computer 
and my business server. And the only thing that goes through there is what I put through there. And it's completely uh, safe from the internet, generally speaking. It's a point to point tunnel. Um, it, it is only from my computer to my server, nothing else. Everything else will just go through the internet, internet like normal. The VPNs that we're seeing advertised like crazy now are specifically for the sake of anonymity, uh, accessing the internet anonymously. Um, it changes your presented IP address, meaning what actually happens is if I'm on a VPN here and if the school network allows me to, to connect to it, it may not in this case. A lot of well-managed networks want to even allow these VPNs, external VPNs, because it's certain that's their um, security. Um, my computer would be completely encrypted and secured between here and the VPN service, which probably is in China. Um, in any given case. So it goes out to China and then it decrypts it and then it makes a connection out to say Amazon or Google or wherever. And then it gets its information, comes back and it comes back through that time. At that point that the action makes the request to Google or Amazon is a server over in China or Finland or wherever it may be. And that server's IP address is what they log as having access to that service. What the VPN doesn't do is it doesn't prevent you from sending anything. It doesn't prevent you from logging into Google. Either. So if you go in, you log into a Google service and you're connected to a VPN. So you go to google.com, log into your Gmail, and then you go and search for something. It is still trapping you because it knows that you logged in. Um, and I would say 99% of people have perpetually logged in to some account that is tracking basically. Um, this isn't the answer that I want to give, but the simple fact is that we almost can't keep them from tracking um, The data is uh, the data is just there. Uh, when you log into anything over that VPN, it's got you. So and then um, then you're right back in the, the same boat we were in. A VPN doesn't prevent you from getting viruses. A VPN doesn't uh, prevent you from, I should say, generally speaking, a VPN doesn't prevent you from getting viruses. And they have uh, some sort of uh, an additive service that you can subscribe to that will filter out viruses. But it generally isn't going to do what you think it's going to do. It's not going to actually keep you anonymous. It's not going to actually keep you secure. Your computer is still going to send the same information to and from the same places with the VPN. Um, so this all probably sounds really discouraging. <laughs> um, so that brings me to filtering. This is one of the best things that you can do is actually internet filtering if you're concerned about content and so on and so forth. It's not going to keep you from getting from being tracked, but it will significantly uh, help with the types of tracking that happen. For instance, Google's uh, AdWords. You go onto a whole lot of websites now and you see these advertisements. So this tiny little blue text that says Google AdWords. Uh, that's because that that uh, that Google ad has been deployed on that site. Anytime you go and touch that, Google knows who you are. Uh, it'll love where you've been, it'll love sites you're looking at, a lot of searches that you're doing, even if you're not using Google search engine, it's amazing what they can find. So uh, the internet filtering, a lot of the systems you can filter out ads, including Google AdWords, uh, which means that Google and other companies like that are gonna have a full, uh, they're going to have a, a really hard time tracking you, at least through that type of media. Google AdWords and Facebook advertisements and things like that. Those are on a whole lot of sites. So that's a huge uh, chunk out of their uh, analytics that they'll, that they'll get. Um, you got two, two types. If you were to visualize the internet here, your firewall here or your modem, and you here, you're talking to the internet through this firewall or this modem. A transparent internet filter is going to sit somewhere between your computer and the internet. And as your computer is talking to and from the internet, it's going to analyze everything your computer is doing. And it's going to filter the traffic 
uh, based upon uh, what your preference is. Or it may be a system that only logs your traffic, uh, say in the case of some uh, parental uh, filtration systems. Um, if there's anybody that is uh, interested in the systems that would be good for like a home loan network or maybe a small business network, you know, a small business. Um, I've only, I've worked with a handful of them. Uh, the most recent one that I deployed for somebody was Griffin. I hadn't even heard about it. Um, one of my clients, uh, wives just showed up at the thing and said, hey, I want you to install this. And I was thinking, well, this is going to be awful. It actually was pretty easy. Um, and it did a good it did a good job of what it was doing. It filtered the traffic nicely. She could see, you know, her kids. She could see all the other uh, users on the network. If they connect to the wireless, it goes through that. It logs the traffic, restricts all kinds of things based on um, on your preference. You know, it, it lets you know what what devices are connected to the network. You can tailor the traffic from there. Tailored based on age, uh, content filter, and you can disable that to prevent specific pages like Facebook, YouTube, Google, um, you know, whatever, whatever types of pages you might want to. Question. Did, yes. Did you notice that it slowed? The... Uh, no, I did I did a throughput test. Um, in this particular case, they were not on a particularly robust connection because they're out in Wilder and they're on one of those wireless links up safely, uh, but still a pretty decent connection. And uh, because I'm familiar with their network, um, I, can, I can say confidently that it didn't impact the throughput on it. Um, but that is a significant, uh, significant point. Yeah. A lot of these systems, uh, to his point, a lot of these systems that are transparent systems, it has to analyze everything. And that means if you download a huge file, it's going to be looking at it. Uh, it can really slow down a network. But the equipment, in this case, this equipment seems to be so efficient. I checked that specifically with large downloads. It seemed to be so efficient, I couldn't even tell. Um, they're streaming, you know, uh, multiple TVs through the system and so on and so forth. And it's fine with, with a pretty high definition video. Um, so I don't think there would be a tremendous speed impact with this particular system. And most of them that are coming out are more are pretty high. But, Pretty high bandwidth uh, connections coming in, so uh, to most of our homes anymore. So that is one option: is the transparent uh, method. I will tell you, it is the most stable stable method. It's the most predictable. And it's probably the least troublesome as long as you get a good system. The other option is what we call endpoints. Uh, anytime, anytime you deploy like antivirus, that would be an endpoint protection. Anytime you deploy an internet filter directly on the computer, that is endpoint protection. Um, the endpoint protection is installed directly on the computer. It's software based. Um, the Griffin, for instance, while it uses software to analyze everything, it's a separate piece of hardware that goes in your network. Controls everything. Uh, the endpoint software is just installed on a computer as an uh, additive software, um, it can be defeated by a 10 year old, um, you know, if, they, if they're, they're savvy or not. Um, it, uh, generally speaking, it's troublesome enough, it'll alert you if somebody's trying to you know, mess around with it and defeat it. Um, it's still good stuff. Um, it may not inspect secured traffic, in some scenarios, uh, but that's going to be the, the case with just about any system. So, um, that maybe it's one of the oldest ones. Covenant Dies, I think, is a, a Christian outfit. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot of others. Uh, also, internet service providers, by the way, the transparent end of things. Uh, internet service providers almost always will offer some sort of content filtering if you want to go that route and not deal with the additional hardware. Um, however, those logs and that control exists on their end, you probably will have very little control over it. Whereas with a system like the Griffin, you know, with pretty granular control, very specific control, um, that will increase to us. Um, so uh, on the firewall, pretty well already established. When you get a motor from the internet service provider, you already have a firewall. You probably have two of them. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean for that to be on that. 
but uh, you probably have two firewalls already. There's one built in to your uh, to your operating system. Apple has them, Windows has them. They're all pretty decent. They're good. They uh, they're just fine. The problem with those firewalls and where you end up with a with actual trouble with them is where you let something in, you execute something on your you're like virus, and that is uh, nefarious. And uh, then those things can be closed. Um, there's a, a general idea that the Apple, Apple platform, by the way, it's a modern topic, is, uh, is more hack proof um, and secure. Generally, that's probably the most users. Um, a clean Windows user, though, someone who's careful with Windows, um, they're going to be as safe as an Apple user, generally speaking. Don't fear the penguin. <laughs> or you can go the Linux direction, which is really, yeah. If you're doing that anyway, you're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. Do you guys have any questions on any, any of that? Um, what is your thoughts on my on my fast path that saves all your passes in one spot? Well, <laughs> it's I mean the, the concerns with it are um, I mean they're pretty straightforward, they're obvious, which is why you're asking the question in the first place, right? Um, so last pass, it's it's a nice idea. I use something like that. Uh, I won't tell you what it is, but um, I do use something like that. I even use a spreadsheet in some cases for some of my last critical instances. Um, if you use a system like LastPass, for those of you who don't know uh, what it is, it basically is a password database. You can download the app on your phone, on your computer, and you can save all of your usernames and passwords for all the different websites, and different applications, and so on and so forth. Um, for your devices, your computers, and that's whatever. Um, the, the conceptual problem is if you have a one master password, you have all the passwords, right? Um, in practice, I have not actually seen any problems with, with those applications because they tend to be very secure. Um, and the uh, fact is that pretty much everybody that's deploying that kind of technology, they are requiring two factor authentication or two-state authentication or uh, there are a variety of, of different terms for it. But basically what that means is like when you log into your bank account or into Facebook, uh, if you've got to secure a little bit better than the out the box configuration, um, it says we need your phone number, we need an email, um, and they may offer some alternative means of contact. Not only do you have to have your username and password for the last pass app, you also have to have access to a device that it's going to send a verification code to before it'll let you log into that system. That's the second factor of the two factor. <laughs> so I don't know if this has happened to anybody else, but I keep on, on Facebook, which I'm using less and less of. Uh -huh. That's why I have to give it a list of things recommended. I keep getting friend requests from friends that I already have. Yeah. And I call them and they say, I didn't make it. Yeah. I've even gotten messages about things. And I, after I said, gosh, I haven't talked to you in a long time. We visited. <laughs> they started yeah. asking some things and I called my friend and went to her. Yeah, yeah. So that's where the, uh, we'll get to you too in just a moment. Uh, that's where the misconception mis uh, of being hacked. Uh, comes into play that I alluded to earlier. Uh, when that happens, your friend has not been hacked. Uh, when you get a friend request from somebody that you're already friends with, they have been uh, duped. They've been spooked, basically would be the term. Their account, uh, somebody has taken all of the public facing information from their account, like their photo, their basic information, so on and so forth. Created a duplicate of the account so it looks just like them. They use their name, they make everything look as close as possible, and they send out a bunch of friend requests. And the reason that happens to most people is because they have their friends list exposed to the public. If you have your friends list exposed to the public, that means that somebody else can see all those friends. They can go on and create a duplicate account, they can add all those people, they can start sending messages out and fishing for an opportunity to uh, type them up. 
<laughs> so it is the end result. So uh, in that case, they haven't been an apt, but the duty is steer clear of that, be vigilant about it. I would recommend that people shut down, uh, go on your friends list and make it so it's not public. We'll see a whole lot less of that on your Facebook. Well, she asked me if I was the at the, uh, the award, and she uh, said, I got my dues, you know, and then, then you know, she started saying, did, did it come to your address yeah. or which address? And they and when she started asking me for information, I yeah. there's been some problems. There's going to be a wide variety of, of uh, angles that they'll take. Basically, if you're getting a friend request from somebody you're already friends with, that's the way it is to scam. You can you can do them a favor. You can report it to Facebook as if you get a for a scam account. It gets shut down. So, can you talk a little bit about Tor and Tor over VPN? Because I've heard conflicting accounts about those two things. Yeah. So and so you're talking about the internet alternative, the whole the whole what yeah, Tor matter. Yeah. yeah. So. So Tor is what's referred to as a decentralized network. It's like the internet on the internet, uh, but segregated. So <laughs> if, I can, if I can give a brief uh, synopsis of it, it's basically imagine that it's a sandbox that, uh, that you can go and play in any time you want, but nobody knows whose house it's at. It's just kind of there. Uh, it actually is decentralized, meaning that it doesn't exist. Let's say I connect to, I go to amazon.com or I go to google.com. It's gonna go, it's gonna look up their information and it's gonna go, it's gonna go send a request directly to one of those servers. And that server, which exists, but I can, I can go to Amazon and I can connect to it and I can tell you exactly where it is geographically. And it sends that data back and I'm connected there. The Tor network is decentralized. Meaning that there is no central server. It is a wide array of servers that are hosting a wide array of pages. And it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a different concept. Um, and it goes back to the days of peer to peer file sharing when, when uh, uh, MP3s were a real hot topic and everybody was trying to shut down the music industry and stuff for a long time. We were sharing MP3s over the internet. Because MP3s were shared with decentralized. Uh, system in most cases when it got wrong. Basically, those files would go out there, somebody would download the files, and then that file existed on their computer, and then their computer shared it out to the rest of the people that were requesting. And those computers would, would keep a copy or a partial copy of it, and those computers would be able to serve that up. So it's this, it's this organically exponentially growing network. Um, and all of that, all of those files, I could delete it off my computer and the rest of the computers that had downloaded it are still going to serve out for those people who were requesting. That's kind of how the Tor network works um, with some significant variations. Uh, as to the, uh, are you asking about the legitimacy of it or? I'm asking just how private it is because I've heard conflicting accounts as to who owns the that majority of the Tor server, I've been hearing that a lot of Tor servers are actually government owned or government owned. Yeah, so you've got, you've got a problem when, whenever the uh, service is implicated, basically. But uh, generally speaking, uh, while it may be government owned and there may be some degree of a privacy <coughs> issue, generally speaking, it's still fairly secure. Uh, I mean, very secure, but uh, it comes down to the wisdom of what you're sharing. Uh, are you actually an, an anonymous as, as a user on a Tor network? Probably, yeah. I mean, generally speaking. Uh, to give you an example, the exploit that was done on my father's radio station, they are still up and running. They're, they're, they're rolling in the dough. Every transaction is done through Bitcoin or something similar. And uh, in order to go on and see what the amount would have been that was owed, that was done through the Tor network. So they're at least anonymous enough uh, to stay away from the government entities that would be able to shut them down. And they, they exist on the Tor network pretty, pretty, uh, I mean, they're pretty just out there about if you have their address. So 
I don't think that there is likely a privacy issue on the floor. Uh, I think that it's possible to track people down on there, but it's mostly possible based on the information they provide, not on the infrastructure itself. Do you know where your where your team were attacked from? Uh, yeah, it was it was uh, it was about ten countries. Uh, I mean, it was all over, yeah, and some of it was from inside the United States off of virtual servers at Amazon or Microsoft too, where you can deploy, you can you can go on, I can go on, I can pay two bucks and have a computer ready to ready to use and however I want out on the internet through Microsoft, through Amazon, through any number of what are called virtual private uh, providers. Uh, they basically spin up a virtual private box, they call it, but it's really a computer. The virtual computer and it's fully functional. So these um, different countries go for attacking. Yeah, and so so they would do that. They would lease one of these boxes from Microsoft or, or wherever, and they would use that as uh, as, as an initiation point to attack. Uh, probably a whole lot of people not just in the uh, Anyway, the the majority of it came from Germany. Uh, there was Germany. Uh, Russia, which was interesting because it was right around the election. Um, and uh, oh, surprisingly, not any from Finland. Um, but yeah, in Russia, Canada, there's two within the United States, um, France. China. France. Who? France. I think, I think there was, I think there was, I just don't remember for sure. Um, so, but these are not, you know, these are just, these are um, nefarious individuals operating under the radar. What about that? So, anyway, so we had. Yeah, I was told one time that you get used to when you're using your mouth, uh -huh. that the first click is, is a pick or pointing at something. But if you double click it, it's a launch. It could start from going up that they're looking at. And they also said that this is the answer problem. Put one email on your email list of AAAXX, blah, blah, blah. And then if somebody tries to steal your email account, they'll come up with an error all the time. Yeah. No, um, yeah, so so on the first one, that specifically, uh, there are a, a variety of different interface types. Uh, for instance, we're dealing with a touch screen, touch screen computer here. Now, if I go and I touch anything on this screen, it's going to execute that application. The same as if I were to double click on it on this, it's just a sim simply a difference in the interface. So whether you single click or double click, on anything that does affect whether or not it actually launches, uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't uh, really determine much. I mean, it's the interface that determines what that action does. Um, so, but as far as uh, launching, that's where it comes down to to good uh, user habit. If you're launching something nefarious on your computer in the first place, it's because you were probably uh, you were probably too careless on the internet or whatever, downloaded something that. Um, you shouldn't be launching in the first place. You can launch all day long anything that's on your computer on a fresh computer and you're not going to hurt. Um, you know, you might mess up your configuration a little bit, but you're not going to actually get anything in there that's um, too troublesome. Uh, it's whenever you get third party content in there from a third party who has uh, ill intentions. So, so that's, uh, yeah, and then he had one, one more. What was the second half of that? Was, uh, in your email, if you, oh. if you put that in, I uh, had the error pop up. Yeah. I was to leave it, but I was trying to use that file. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure specifically what that's referring to, but if, if it has to do with the actual email address itself, uh, there is no situ there is no circumstance where it that should cause a problem, and, and to the degree that there is. Inaccessibility issue ever. That's a that's a system problem. Somebody hacked your your email. If that file was in it, it wouldn't be in there. No, no. 
No, I can't imagine any scenario under which that would actually be the case generosity. So if a file was going to give an error like that, it would uh, probably wouldn't allow you to place the receipt. That would be a very exceptional one off situation. Do you have a question? Uh, well, two quick comments um, that kind of relate to this. One, I applied once for a job with INL's security department or cybersecurity. And in the phone interview, he asked, what do I do to secure my home network? And I went through about 20-ish things. If anybody wants to know what they are afterwards, um, I'd gladly share them. But his response was eye-opening because I thought I was doing a really good job. He said, you are almost paranoid enough. And this is from some of the leading um, cybersecurity people out of INL. Um, the second one is I worked for the Iraqi survey group uh, in Qatar. Um, we were looking for weapons of mass destruction, uh, evidence of it on captured digital media. And I am here to tell you, if you delete something off of your computer, it is still there. So don't ever put anything on your computer you're not willing to let somebody see, possibly see eventually, because it is almost always there. It is extremely difficult to really erase anything from that hard drive. People with the right software, like what I was using, can find it. Not only can we find it, we can, let, we can find your last 12 versions of it. That's where firearms come in. <laughs> it's a good way to describe it. Um, yeah, and I think I think you had a follow up question. Is that right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, was going to ask you what about four yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's 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 sort of the same concept at that point. Of course, very really secure. Yeah, it does anonymize. Um, you're already anonymous on tour, generally speaking. You're concerned about what your, your actual point you're connecting to, identifying your ID. Yeah. You tour over VPN, it looks like you're connected in support with China. Yeah, it adds another layer for, for anybody that I know or have ever met. They're not important enough for somebody to spend the time to, to decide for all that, uh, honestly, because it would reduce the returns. So, yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> sometimes when I'm at a hotel and I connect to their Wi Fi, they'll say, this is a secure And And I, I mean, I usually, it's like I got to do what I have to do. But yeah. Kind of but I just want, like, what, and I, I don't know this, but I'm just assuming that my computer. I use a Mac and I'm just assuming that there's like something that uh, keeps the other people in the hotel or what you know from is it? Here's your answer. Okay. Okay. So basically when you're doing that, so do you connect into a VPN to work? I don't. Or are you just connecting to like email and so on and so forth? Yeah, email or or like uh, what do you use for email? Gmail. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's it's our our <laughs> yeah, your corporate right, but it's, it's yeah yeah I've managed a lot of them. Um, so this is the answer to that. What happens is when you log into your to your uh, Gmail account, if you look up at your title bar, you can see a padlock up there. You can see it's actually uh, your computer is tracking it for security. Now you can go through a, a great number of unsecured systems. But what's happening is it's transmitting this through all those unsecured systems. And until somebody intercepts that data and has this key, they can't touch it. I mean, they can touch it, they can get it, they can download it, they can try and you know, get at it all day long. But when you're dealing with 256 bit encryption on most of the sites anymore, which is the same as what banking uh, institutions use for all of their stuff, uh, basically. Um, they're not going to get you data. So even though you're connected to an unsecured network, 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Here's where the problem with an unsecured network comes in. If you do not have a firewall on your computer itself, then your computer is subject to the security of that network of those same initials. Um, but your computer has a firewall. A shared computer has a firewall out of the box anymore, and it's not really a problem. Um, some people would disagree with me. Generally speaking, there's a certain there's a there's an argument to be made that I'm incorrect on this. But generally speaking, practically speaking, with a number of uh, tremendous number of users that I deal with, and users in a variety of scenarios, everywhere from a fairly you know the fairly ignorant users to somebody who's pretty tech savvy. That's not a problematic scenario for me because I know that when you're logging into Gmail, it is encrypting the connection authentically. So at the computer is uh, is the public key. At the other end, is the private key. Now it doesn't work exactly like this with Google, but it's the same concept. So you've got those two keys at the end. And then as far as every piece of technology, including that unsecured wireless private connection is concerned, that computer is spitting gibberish across the world, and it will never be able to interpret that gibberish without, without <laughs> The exception to that, don't log on to those networks during the cybersecurity events in Vegas if you're in if you're in Vegas at the same time, because they have told me for fun, they sit there and try and hack everybody else's computers that they yeah. can find during those events. And that goes back to so that goes back to the computer itself being secured. They're not actually intercepting that traffic; it's decrypting it with the key inputs. They're exploiting the computer itself. Okay. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, up front here, and then we'll get you. Oh. Or you? Oh, you? Yeah, you. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, I, my right now I'm on the website. So I kind of think there's people that want to hack me and stuff. I mean, sure. So and I don't understand all this stuff at all. Would you recommend like any like Proton Mail or something like that? And would you recommend VPN or is it that big of a deal? So the, there is some other security aspect of the VPN that comes into play, but it really only comes into play on a on a network where Let's see if I can keep this simple. When you connect from your home, you connect into your home wireless network and you go out onto the internet, it logs your IP address, right? But that IP address changes on your, on your network. When you have a home internet connection, basically every internet service provider, your address changes periodically. So they can have some idea, but they don't have a specific attack point that never changes. The school here, if you went out from the school, your IP address would never change. Uh, because they have static addresses that are, uh, it's critical that they have addresses that don't change, but that also means that they have greater responsibility. So when so I go to different places, it might say my daughter's house, that I've been there before, that I can address all the same. It's going to be different. Um, it's even your daughter's houses, they're pretty much all, they're all going to change uh, periodically. So, but but the VPN, the nice thing about the VPN is that it makes it look like you're in, in China, Canada, other parts of the United States, you know, Finland, wherever. Uh, it makes it look like you're elsewhere uh, on the surface. Ultimately, that is not where you're going to get exploited, almost always. Um, you know, your, your home network is probably not a great attack service. It might get into the router and mess with things, but not that likely to be able to do a whole lot of it. Unless they're giving you an off without attention. Um, but even, even then, the basic firewall technology in these modems and routers is actually pretty good. Well, but mostly, if, like, I get things all the time, hey, I think you're in this picture. Is this you? There so is your problem right there. That's the one that will be good. And so, and the other yeah. part is, like, um, I guess, like, the email, there's, there's stuff that. People send us all the time, yeah. and we kind of have security through the our website services. But because sometimes you know somebody has a letter that they want you to read, but it's on that file. Yeah. So if you pull, I mean, that, 
that will open up like if it's a bad file. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a variety of a variety of ways that CD attacks happen. Generally speaking, they do a pretty good job of mitigating the, uh, the means through which attackers attempt to compromise you. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't give a pat answer to this uh, because it's all so dynamic, it's always changing. It's tremendous changes. But your first line of defense is your uh, your habitual nature, whatever that is, you want to be vigilant about just kind of checking, like, did this come from a legitimate person? If you're really not sure about it, or if it looks like it came from somewhere that's legitimate, and that it looks like something they might not send, contact them, like Liz has done in a in the situation with Facebook, and so on. Just call them, hey, did you send this to me? Just want to make sure. The two seconds it'll take to do that is worth Because I have noticed, like, supposedly I got something uh, Amazon. So, like, I just hovered the thing over it and it's some weird email address. So, yeah. So, that's. Yeah. So, and that's the, the fact that you have identified that is, is a good sign. It's easier to be at least moderately vigilant about how they contribute there's legitimacy to the things that you're, you're exploring. And that's, that's the best thing you can do. Do we have any other questions? Sure. No, we did have one more that was. Oh, well, just one more in the back. She's been waiting. So. Okay, so our phone, which we do 95% of the law, including my investing, including my, my banking, including my payment and stuff. Uh, well, your phone is most likely encrypted. Don't lose it. And uh, especially don't lose it with the number written on the back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's, that's the thing. You, you're going to have, you've got, you've got some great biometrics in the, newer, in the newer phones, whether they're iPhones or Android or whatever. Most of them now, as they come from the factory, they are encrypted so that if somebody gets a hold of your phone physically and they go and try and plug into it and pull data from it, um, without, uh, without your biometric or at least your PIN number or something like that, uh, they're not going to be able to access that data in most cases. Uh, there are exceptions to that, uh, but that's mostly with older devices. The newer devices, they get a bit more paranoid than rightly so. And uh, so set up biometrics on your phones uh, or, you know, set up uh, a PIN number at least. And most of the phones anymore, you can go in. If they're not encrypted, you can go into your settings and tell it to encrypt them your security settings. So if that's the best thing you can do, um, losing your phone probably isn't as big a deal as you might think in most cases, if you have appropriate security settings. Okay. 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 Oh, so we did have one question. I just want to put a question. Uh, yeah. Do you mind using that filter on mail since I was with surrender while we were using a mail? I've been asked about those on mail. Yeah, I haven't looked into it um, a whole lot. Uh, the, the things that I do know about it, it's probably uh, fairly legitimate. It's again, it's another one of those things. Um, my understanding is that there's a key exchange like this. One key is on your end, one key is on the recipient's end. If that's the case, probably pretty secure in most, uh, most any scenario. Yeah, if the key exists between you and it's going from you to the server, it's getting decrypted and then re encrypted from the server to them, then you've got. Problem because you've got a precipice there where your data exists in security. That's probably that's not the case. Yeah, I believe that's end to end encryption. And you have the, the key exchange going on like we have here. And it's probably very secure, generally speaking. There's always. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you for